Hi there, invertebrate enthusiasts, and welcome <clears throat> to this lecture where we're going to talk about all things thread-like, or the NEMA, NEMA Greek for thread. Three um, different groups, the Nemertians, which are spiralian, so close relatives to the mollusks, and then two much more closely related, related groups, the nematodes and the nematophorans, which are ectisozoans. So we're going to start off with the Nemertians. This is the first or sorry, the last of the spiralian groups that we're going to deal with. They're moderately diverse, about 1,300 species, mostly marine. They tend to be ambush predators. There's a really characteristic kind of a reversible proboscis uh, that you'll see that they use. Um, commonly, they're called ribbon worms. And they've been, um, the estimate of 1,300 species is, is in dispute. Uh, you can see, read there at the bottom, that there's, um, approximately half of the 1,300 species were described before 1900. And so Schudenberg, who's a bit of a pessimist, says many descriptions are so vague and incomplete that they can't be used to identify species. And in many cases, it's not particularly clear what the names actually refer to. So this may be a case where there's not just cryptic diversity, but names that have been created that don't actually mean anything anymore. But let's learn a little bit about the Nemertians. So the first thing you're seeing, this is not a Nemertian. That was a, this is a polychaete worm. And the Nemertian is this sinister sock where the mouth is opening up now and engorging that annelid. So in the apomorphies for the Nemertians is this, the rinca seal. So it's a fluid filled chamber that contains the proboscis the actual proboscis itself, and the fact that they don't have any chidae. So remember with the ectisozoans, the presence of chidae is one of the apomorphies for the group. So this is, chalk it up, yet another case where the principal apomorphy for the group is lost uh, in some cases. So evolution by a loss, not simply evolution by a gain. So this proboscis, this is one mildly terrestrial. Come on, buddy. Maybe I should push it. Can so you push it? Goodness. Have you ever Dude, seen no, one of these? I've never seen it. Oh. You ready? Uh, yeah, do it again. That's the proboscis being a very objective of the mucus. So the body wall uh, from your text here, chapter 12, looking at a cross section of the body wall, you can see there's a ciliated glandular epidermis right here. Uh, cephalic glands and different layers of muscle. Then the rinca seal in the center in here, this open cavity that contains the proboscis. Lots of circular muscle going around the body. There's cephalic glands on the head that secrete slime. Uh, the body's body is there's a large amount of, of muscle, so it's mostly burrowing. That's one of the very few examples where we see uh, the circular muscle found inside the longitudinal muscle. So there you can see a picture of that again. So the circular muscle down here contained within the longitudinal muscle running back to front. So the fluid filled salomic cavity is contains the wrinkle seal. You can see some examples of crazy here. Now, these aren't just hairstyles for various uh, despicable me or minions, but that's various examples of the ring console being averted out of the body. It can be super long, 30 times the length of the body, uh, tipped by a stylet, so right in here, which is a calcareous barb that's not directly venomous, but there are glands around the barb that then secrete neurotoxins or adhesives. There's another example of somebody finding an MRTN and bothering it until it averts its rinkocele, a particular sinister looking one. So another example of a Nemertian feeding on an annelid. So that was the proboscis that's just shot out. Uh, slow motion, I've slowed it down there so you can see it again, that it reaches out bam, and hits the annelid, 
and then we're going to watch it slowly be consumed. It's a sinister looking sock puppet kind of a mouth. Carnivores. Um, it's a one-way gastrointestinal tract that allows for specialization in a through gut, a mouth, and an anus. You've got, uh, there's the central stylet. There's salomic circulation of respiratory fluids um, that move around the body with muscular contraction and the beating of cilia. Um, no gills. They're asexual. They're gonochoric. Um, there is asexual reproduction, rather, and they are gonochoric with external fertilization. So you can see some of them can be broken off and we can have tiny little ones made up later on, but then there are female ones filled full of egg capsules. So one of the characteristic larval stages for the Nemertians is this kind of mushroom cap shaped palladium larva that's characterized by these larval invaginations or the ectoderm invaginations of the ectoderm. This is the iconic Nemertian larva called the pylidium. It looks like a hat with ear flaps. The ear flaps are called the lappets. There's also these two lobes. You can see a ciliated band spanning the lobes and lappets. Beautiful. An apical tuft at the anterior end. And inside the pylidium, you can see its gut, which is this dark brown area, and a little juvenile worm right in the round. This is the iconic Nemertian larva called the pylidium. So this is Parasundin, where the kind of the, the um, glass is half empty. Uh, Swede talking about the systematics of Nemertians. The systematics of Nemertia was and still is problematic with taxa above a specific level not being identified by synapomorphies and most names may not refer to actual things to monophyletic groups. So this is a recent um, set of sequences that I downloaded from a recent paper. So we find the fact that the tax taxonomists in this case are for Nemertians are, are beginning to use more and more DNA to complement their identification of monophyletic groups because there's not a lot of diagnostic features, characteristic pigmentation, external characteristics that allow them to separate species. But in this case here, with the Sorelobratus, this marine Nemertian, you can see in red these sequences that are clearly where genetic divergence is measured across the tree here. But this cluster in red is clearly a different sequence than that upper cluster, which is clearly a different uh, sequence from a different species than the top cluster. So otherwise, small, relatively difficult to identify marine thread-like worms, where DNA is allowing us to tease apart who's who and who's playing different roles in their environment. So that's the last of the spiralians. In here, the Nemertians. Now we're going to move down into the ectisozoans and begin talking about our first groups there, the nem nematodes and the nematophorans. The root of the first of the prefix there is the same Greek for thread, nema, but remember ne nematodes and nematophorans are closely related. Nemertian worms are not. It's just describing the thread-like nature. So the first group that we'll start out with is the nematodes. The nematodes you've probably run into before, super numerous. I have a, <clears throat> as one does, I have a nematode biologist friend, a Scottish friend, who claims that if everything on the face of the planet was muffled, was, was uh, dissolved, lost, if there was like the leftovers where we all just ascended, for a quick second, there would be an, a shape a ghost-like shape of all of the things, of all the trees, of all the people, of all the animals. And that ghost-like shape would be the parasitic and free-living nematodes that are in, on, and around us at all times. So they're much more diverse than that number in the last slide, in the done slide. Those are described species. There's undoubtedly many, many more. And we're only going to be able to kind of scratch the surface of their diversity here. Nematodes have free living forms, parasitic forms, uh, and plants, uh, they, they eat plants, they eat animals. 
there's a lot of their complex uh, life cycles are, are enabled because of the complex and their complex cuticle in their body wall. They molt. They have no circular muscles, just longitudinal muscles. They have a reduced um, uh, hemocele, and the nervous system is entirely captured within the epidermis. So just longitudinal rust muscles, nothing going around the body. And that hemocele that's exaggerated there for clarity um, is just to emphasize the fact that they, they're a little whip-like worm that is going to undulate back and forth because the circular muscles, there's no antagonistic firing here that allows a coordinated swimming motion. There's just whipping back and forth, and I'll show you a picture of that here. So relatively efficient undulating movement, uh, that's coordinated, coordinated firing of these longitudinal muscles and permitted by the elastic cuticle, so it's not a hardened shell, results in these eel-like undulations in the dorsoventral plane rather than side to side, as you see in eels, but eel-like, just not um, laterally, but dorsal, ventrally, top to bottom. So one of the characteristics of their nervous system are these amphids that are little invaginations in the body, um, in the front, in the, in the mouth that seem to be mechano and chemoreceptors. So we have lots of papilla and openings in the mouth there that are, that are, um, setae that, that allow them to touch with and, and explore, um, mechanoreceptors that, that respond to the shaking and the movement around them, and chemoreceptors allowing them to undulate towards something. So these are classic smellers and tasters of the world. Nutrition-wise, there can be free-living ones that are carnivorous, herbivorous, activorous, fungivorous. If there's another life form out there, there are nematodes that eat them. They're deposit feeders, they're parasites uh, of both animals and plants. Um, and a lot of that is accomplished by uh, adaptations in the mouth, where there is a muscular pharynx here, and often with a stylet or some kind of piercing body mouth part that allows the insertion of the muscular of the of the stylet, and then that muscular pharynx creates pressure that that sucks out. Um, plant phloem or interst you know, intracellular fluid within an animal. So teeth, and, and so that was a simple, simple stylet you saw there, but they're highly specialized teeth that result in highly specialized modes of feeding and really close one-to-one -one species adaptation. So you're seeing here some uh, specialized teeth that are, um, these are carnivorous on protozoans, whereas the one that set of teeth over here are intestinal parasites that are just glomming on uh, to little microvilla in your intestine. And the top sinister looking thing is the dog hookworm. That muscular pharynx that is sucking out um, is, if you cross it, section it, is triradiate, which is a, a um, an adaptation for uh, sucking, that it increases the, the pressure. So it's a pump that sucks food from the mouth and out into the intestine. And these three bands of muscle around the body allow the body to be stretched out and the pressure created, the negative pressure created, that then draws the fluid out of the host or the host, whether it's whatever kind of cell it's parasitizing or feeding on. Lined in cuticle, so it's tough. They don't have any nephridia. They use these rennet cells, which are excretory glands and canals. These are these kind of sac-like. Um, we think they're used in osmoregulation. We're not sure what they secrete, but they might secrete a gelatinous matrix around the egg, a glycoprotein. They don't uh, excrete pure urine, but it's an ammonia, and it diffuses across the body wall. They're gonochoric. They're, although there are some hermaphrodites, like the famous C. elegans, the developmental an evolutionary kind of stable uh, animal, C. elegans. There's internal fertilization with a seminal receptacle in the female, and they're sexually dimorphic. So you're looking at two different individuals here, male and a female, um, both sexes with a cloaca, but you can see the spicule here on the bottom. The spicule is a male copulatory organ. There's another a blow up of it over here. 
that holds the female gonopore open during the transmission of sperm. The sperm themselves are aflagellate. They're more amoeboid looking than the classic looking that you're picturing. And then you can see here a diagram with the cloacal opening and the spicule kind of contained within, and then the duct, the sperm duct, where sperm are produced, moved down, and then ejected out. So one neat adaptation, um, or our use, one of human use of this incredibly diverse phylum is with the, the what I call the workhorse of, of developmental and evolutionary biology, C. elegans, where these nematodes, free-living nematodes, have recently been found to be attracted to urine, more attracted to urine from cancer patients, patients suffering from cancer, while they shy away from urine for non-cancerous patients. And this is a this surprising result suggests the neat and interesting use and a novel and, and potentially simple field-based technology that could be used to test for cancer when away from uh, infrastructure and electricity. So good uses of uh, nematodes, but there's also many, many parasites. Uh, eggs, once released into the world, can last for upwards of 20 years. Um, there's some estimates that more than 1.2 billion people in the world are affected with nematode parasites of some order. And what you're looking at here, this unfortunate bowl of spaghetti or the Ascaris nematode worms extracted from the intestines of a single child. There's a pig example here, and this is a dog example. And that dog example, this is a, a video you can go and watch where one of the dogs, this Rosie, was a dog or is a dog of a student uh, who took the course in 2015. And she had a rough time. And we'll fast forward to what they extracted out of her, which is a lot of kidney worms. And she's feeling much better now, which is great news. So some other examples that you might be familiar with for parasitic nematodes include loa loa, a decronculoid that uh, other ones associated with river blindness that are transmitted into humans via insects. Dr. Barry Schechter has found a parasitic worm in Carmen's eye. The next step is to get the worm out as soon as possible. The chance could be that the worm would go beneath her eyelids and into an area where we couldn't find it. So we needed to move quickly to really get her into the operating room as fast as possible so that the worm wouldn't disappear, we wouldn't lose our prey. Dr. Schechter has the procedure recorded and begins by administering a local anesthetic. I was awake during the surgery. And I got really scared. There could have been some damage to her optic nerve and, or perhaps a rupture of a, of a delicate blood vessel that could have led to some bleeding behind her eye. So we needed to get it out as quickly as possible. Dr. Schechter cuts into her eyeball and manages to get a hold of the worm. But getting it out intact won't be easy. Sometimes when you cut a worm in half... So a guinea worm, a uh, guinea worm, a jaconculoid, slender thread-like worm uh, that parasitized kind of embedded itself in connective tissue and body cavities of vertebrates the definitive host of this one is a human and the intermediate host is a freshwater copepod crustacean the female can be up to a meter and a 20 centimeters long and extracting them is really quite difficult what you're looking at there is a matchstick that used to be used to twist around the trachonculoid to pull it out and people think that this strategy might actually have been where the catechus came from, this symbol of the medical professional, the medical profession. So you can see the pathway here, contaminated drinking water is where it starts, where the human is, ends up drinking little bits of eggs and, and copepods that contain the worms, and then around and around we go. <laughs> How are you? I'm just fine. Thank you. Let me 
Let me start by saying that is a beautiful necklace you're wearing. <laughs> Thank you what, very much. What is that, sir? This is a pipe filter. I brought it for you. A pipe filter? Yeah. If you go to South Sudan and you're thirsty and you find an empty water hole that may be stagnant with scum on top, put this in your mouth and stick it through the scum and suck it and you won't get guinea worm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. For a second, I thought it was back in the 70s, and me, you, and Willie Nelson were heading <laughs> yeah, up to the room of the White House. I didn't know what was going on I with this. I understand that, yeah. All right, all right. Uh, we've, we've uh, now, now, these are, you have manufactured these for the people of the Sudan? We've sent 13 million of them into South Sudan, so that everybody can have them. And is this what has, uh, uh, is this what has done the job to eradicate guinea worm? Absolutely. It's got, it's got a filter cloth on the bottom. See a little filter cloth? Yes, yes, yes. So you suck the water through that, it takes out the guinea worm eggs, and you won't have a worm this long in your body a, 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 a year after you take, drink the water. You have cut down. How many cases of, of guinea worm have you, are, are there now? Is it? Well, we started out with three and a half million yeah. in 20 countries, 23,600 villages. And now we have 126 cases in the world. 126 cases. Yeah. Hold on, that's amazing. Other nematode transmitted by uh, diseases include elephantiasis, filarious. I we can keep going on. Uh, hookworm or heartworm, rather, in dogs. Many of you are, are if you with dogs or cats, you're giving them drugs in the spring to, to combat heartworm. That's That worm is a nematode. So the other thread, like the last of the three thread-like organisms, or, or taxa rather, that we're gonna talk about today within uh, is the nematophora, which is together with the nematodes, find, forms this monophyletic group within the ectozoans called the nematoidea. So some shared features between nematodes and nematophorans include that there's reduced circular muscle, just lots of thrashing longitudinal muscle, cloaca in both sexes, uh, the ad flagellator amoeboid sperm, the cuticle is collagenous and not chitinous, which is uncommon within the ectosozoans, and they have ectodermal, ventral, and dorsal nerve cords. Nematophorans are often concordian worms, hair worms, or horsehair worms, this is it. This is all there is to look at. Uh, nearly featureless, lacking a distinct head. Musculature is a sheath of striated longitudinal muscle. Um, like nematodes, they don't have any circular muscle. And crowded together, they looked a lot like this Gordian knot, the classic tail, um, tail from the classics of, of Alexander, solving a problem when, when, when Alexander the Great was presented with a problem. Um, of how to undo this complicated knot, how, if he was this great leader of men, of people and ruler, how was he going to undo this knot? And instead of tie, fiddling with it, he cut it with his sword, kind of like Indiana Jones in the whip fight when he pulls out the gun. There's a look at Alexander cutting the Gordian knot. And you may have seen this, it actually came up a few years ago in the Batman versus Superman travesty of a movie when... Um, Bruce Wayne meets. It's the sword of Alexander. It's the blade that cut the Gordian knot. It's a triumph. Yes. Enjoy. So the life cycle for the nematophores is that the larvae um, penetrate the host wall, the host being uh, an insect, and uh, it is then ingested as a free swimming larva or cyst. Uh, there's are some layouts from the uh, thesis of uh, uh, Chris Ernst, uh, a recent PhD uh, postdoc uh, out at UBC, a recent PhD graduate from McGill University. This is a look at what they look like as they emerge from. So all of these worms, all of these nematophores were inside of this poor cricket. And what caused them to emerge was the cricket arriving at a water source. That's somehow sensed by the internal worm and it bursts out of the body and it's a, kind of the worst day for the cricket. So the worms inhabit terrestrial arthropods and induce, they actually manipulate the host to travel to water to induce this explosion uh, where they emerge and enter the water. And exactly how that happens is not known.
So you can see here a uh, layout, taxonomic layout of, of a common, widely distributed species of Gordius, of Gordian worm, the Gordius robustus, that's burst out of this arthropod, a close up, and then a look at the head. And this is hypothesized to be one species uh, widely distributed across North America. You can see collection points there until they were sequenced. And you can see this one thing turns into probably six, seven, or even eight species. So lots that we don't know. Um, traditional methods of, of taxonomic uh, species estimation based on morphology are, are limited here when there's not a lot of external morphology to look at. So another, another recent example that uh, Chris was part of is looking at these uh, single species in the metaform that becomes um, a new species and huge numbers of hosts being infected. So you're going to watch here the water arrive and hit that cricket in the petri dish and then already you can see the nematophorans bursting out of the end of the insect. So those are the thread-based organisms, two of them very closely related in the nematoidea, one of them not in the spiralian, but the nemertian worms up here. So next up, we're going to meet up together and talk about other monophyletic groups within the ectizozoans, the super interesting tardigrades, onychophrons, and arthropods, some of my favorite parts of the year. So enjoy, and we'll see you soon.